method. So, first, first of all, I will talk about probabilistic method. Okay. And this method is a, a non-constructive uh, method uh, pioneered by uh, Eldish, uh, uh, Eldish, Paul Eldish, uh, around the 1960s. Uh, to you know, prove the existence of certain mathematical structure, and it also have a name. It's also known as Aldrich uh, magic. Okay. So, um, whenever you know, in, in a lot of situations, whenever you want to construct a, a mathematical structure with certain properties, you just you know invoke this uh, uh, magic word, Aldrich magic, and probably you can show the problem. So let's take a look at a uh, couple of application to give you the idea of this uh, probabilistic method. So application one. Okay. Uh, we're interested in uh, the Ramsey number. Denoted by R of M M which is actually the smallest number n such that uh, any two calorie okay, here, two col uh, by calorie I mean the, you color all the edges uh, by either uh, blue or red Any two coloring of a complete graph on n, sorry, on n vertices, aka kn contains a monochromatic. Kn, okay. i.e., once you color all the edges of Kn by either blue or red, you can either find uh, a complete graph on a uh, subgraph on m vertices uh, whose edges are all blue, or a complete you know Kn uh, subgraph whose edges are all red. Okay, so let me give you uh, one simple example. So let's consider k series three. Okay. So first of all, I want to convince you that k series three is less than or equal to six. Okay. What that means is whenever you have, you know, a coloring of on uh, on the complete um, graph with six vertices, you can always find a red uh, monochromatic uh, triangle or a blue triangle. Uh, so I will use you know solid line and dash line to uh, represent the coloring. Uh, so we have uh, six vertices, okay. and you look at uh, one of the uh, vertices, and look at you know the popular color of the edges emitting from this vertex. So there are you know five edges going out from this vertex. Therefore, by pigeonhole principle, we know there um, there are at least uh, three uh, edges of the same color. Okay. So say uh, they are of you know blue color. Um, and then if we look at the uh, coloring of the edges between those three vertices, if there is ever one blue uh, blue coloring uh, among those edges then I have a blue a triangle. Otherwise, you know, uh, they, are all, uh, they are all red, therefore I find a red triangle. Okay. So this shows R33 is less than equal to six. Um, and also I claim R33 is greater than five, i.e. Um, this will uh, give us the, the estimation of R33. R33 is equal to five, uh, six. And to show this, we only need to demonstrate a two coloring on K5 such that there is no uh, blue triangle or red triangle. And the way to do that 
is to take uh, color all the address, uh, all those address blue, and all these address red. Okay. So inside this uh, graph, uh, you cannot find a red triangle or a blue triangle. So here, I'm going to show you one application of this probabilistic method to show a lower bound for uh, uh, the Ramsey number. Okay. Theorem. On Mn, I want to show it's greater than some number, okay, which I will denote by f. Okay. And after, you know, after we finish the proof, we will see oh, what kind of bound we can put here. Um, so what do we want to do? Um, we want to find a two coloring of Km such that uh, containing no monochromatic Km subtract. So this is our goal, and so now we want to construct a certain mathematical object um, to satisfy a certain property, and here's where you know, Eldish magic comes in. Instead of explicitly demonstrating such a construction, you just say, I will color the edges randomly. Okay? So this is what we're going to do. Uh, so for each edge, In Km, uh, we color it uh, uh, red with probability half, and color it blue with probability half. Okay. And you color all the edges independently. Okay. So, now we want to estimate the number of monochromatic Km uh, in the color. Question? No. Okay. Um, he, he was so, a question. I mean, he was a question. Okay. Um, so in order to estimate uh, the number of monochromatic Km in the color, uh, we just uh, we can calculate the expect, uh, expected number of uh, monochromatic uh, Km in, uh, in the color ring. Okay. So what we do is to compute the number uh, of the expected number of monochromatic uh, Km in this random color ring. write uh, this ex uh, expectation as summation uh, of uh, over all Km, that is the subgraph of my Km, okay. and then compute the probability of this specific P uh, Km being uh, monochromatic. This is by linearity of expectation. Um, and let's try to compute uh, this probability. So I have a graph, a uh, complete Km graph. And I select n vertices, all of those uh, n vertices. And I want to compute the uh, probability that all the edges okay, inside my Km gets the same color. Okay? So there are two possibilities. One is that they all get uh, color red, and the other is they all get color blue. Okay? So if it's the case that all the edges get color red, then the probability is half to the power of m choose 2. Because there are m choose too many edges in my complete graph, and for each edge, 
the probability that the edge is colored red is half. So this is the probability you get if Km is, all the edges in Km is red. Uh, similarly, um, the probability uh, that all the edges in Km is blue is equal to that. So therefore, you multiply that by 2. Okay. And then, uh, since this summation is over a constant, you get, you know, n choose n times 2 times half to the power m over 2. Okay. And now we wish that this number is less than 1. Why is that? Uh, if the expected number of monochromatic Km in my random coloring is less than or equal to 1, that means there exists some coloring in which there is no monochromatic Km. Okay? So this is why we wish this expectation is less than or equal to 1. And then, you know, once you have that, and you realize that actually you can take n equals 2 to the mm, two to the uh, m over 2. Okay. If you take n equals 2 to the m over 2, the uh, inequality holds. Therefore, you get the result. Okay. So this is a nice and cute uh, application of the probabilistic method. Um, uh, historically, you know, you know, people find it really hard to give an explicit construction over, you know, two to the m over two many vertices, uh, and the uh, coloring over of k n, where n is equal to two to the m over two, such that such that it contains no monochromatic coloring. But using this random, um, you know, probabilistic method, it's say, you know. Even if it's very hard to construct such an example, you can just take a random coloring and it works. Okay? So pretty much it's like saying, we are trying to find a hay in a haystack. And even though it's really hard to find a hay in a haystack, you can just pick a random thing in your haystack and you find a hay. Okay. Um, now let me give you a second uh, application of the probabilistic method. Uh, which you know, which is also nice and cute, uh, so that you know people get familiar with the method, so that we can move on further to the random algebraic method uh, technique. Um, okay. So the second application is also um, you know a classic. Uh, we want to prove uh, any graph G contains. Uh, a subgraph, oh sorry, bipartite subgraph uh, with at least uh, half number of the edges. but there are no edges inside each part. Okay. Um, so given a graph G, uh, how do we cook up or construct a bipartite subgraph with you know, sufficiently many uh, edges? Uh, that is to say, uh, given a graph, for each vertex, you want to decide whether this vertex goes to the left part or the right part. Okay. Um, so again, uh, here the construction is a random construction. You just say, take a vertex of G, and I flip a coin, and I decide whether to put it on the left or on the right. Okay. Then we will calculate the expected number of edges uh, that's, you know, that lies between uh, uh, the, uh, the part heights, uh, part sets, and say, you know, since the expected number of edges we get, is greater than or equal to half of the edges, there is one instance, uh, one partition of the vertex 
uh, such that you know we have this archetype subgraph uh, with sufficiently many edges. So true for each vertex in G, uh, we randomly put it in L or R. Okay, where L, I mean the left part I set, and R is the right part I set. set. Okay. So we're interesting uh, expected number of edges between left and right. Break, the, uh, uh, break this down to a summation of all the edges in G of probability uh, that uh, uh, such that E connects L Again, this is by linearity of uh, expectation. And mm. so now for each you know, specific edge E, you consider the probability mm, if E is like this, E connects L and R. And the probability equals the probability that one, of, one end of the edge lies in uh, the left part I set, and the, the probability uh, uh, and the, the, the other end lies in the other part okay? And exactly the, the probability is half, is you have a, a, a quarter of probability that all the, uh, the ends of the edge all lie in the left part head, and the probability a quarter that they all lie on the right. Therefore, you know, the probability that this edge connects the left and the right is equal to half. So this then is equal to half times the number of uh, edges in G. Therefore, this means uh, there is one uh, way to partition the vertices of G so that the number of edges in between uh, the left and the right is greater than equal to half of the number of edges in G. I guess for this you can also build statistic by I the neighbors to see whether it's on one side or the other. Oh, it's okay. I see what you're saying. Yeah. It's so it's like a, adjusting the, the partition. Yeah. Yeah. Similarly for the for the remedy number there are it's a deterministic way. But I'm just saying, you know, there is a cheap way to get the answer. So you know the talk can um, can keep going, and I can give you, you know so many uh, examples of uh, this method. Actually, there is a book written by Nunga Alon and uh, uh, Joe Spencer on the on this topic. And it consists of plenty of uh, examples. So if you are interested, you can check this book out. Um, but still, I'm going to give you a certain application where uh, the method fits. Okay? But we will look at why, kind of like I get, get some idea why the method fails, and we will try to fix it with uh, the random algebra technique. Number of, of 
had this. Uh, in a bipartite graph. with n vertices on the right. Like that. And n vertices on the right. Such that the graph between the, those two parts, and I have S uh, vertices on the left, T vertices on the right. Okay. So as you could imagine, if I have, you know, uh, I have uh, N, uh, so here what we want to do is to consider a uh, bipartite graph with N vertices on the left and vertices on the right. And we want to, you know, priming as many as uh, as many edges as we can, but not to contain uh, KST as a subgraph. Okay, you cannot just throw all the edges in the graph because once you have all the edges, you can find you know S vertices on the right and T vertices on the left, and then there are uh, there is a KST. Okay. Um, so uh, there is a theorem. Um, by you know, Valerie, Shosh, and Trump. Uh, um, maybe you know about the accent. Um, this simply says the, this number, uh, if I call it m, largest number of edges. This number n is less than or equal to some constant times n to the power of two, one, one, uh, two minus one less. And you know people usually call this theorem KST, uh, even though you know the graph you are looking at contains not KST. <laughs> um, and um, there is an asymmetry in this result because you know um, on the face value you will see you will see that S and T are like should be equivalent, right? They, they. So in order to get the best bound, you would assume S is the, S is the smaller one. For instance, if uh, you know S is equal to two, T is equal to three, by this result, M is less than equal to some constant to the power of N over two minus one over two, or two minus one over three. Apparently, you want to choose uh, the smaller one, therefore, you always assume S is less than equal to T, and this is also you know, the assumption we will adopt. Okay? So now we know this number, you know, the largest number you can cram in on uh, this kind of bipartite graph without having KST is some constant times n to the power of two minus one over s. You would you might be wondering if you know this estimate is sharp, i.e., can we somehow construct cook up a graph with this many edges? So that you know the graph doesn't contain uh, uh, doesn't contain KST. Therefore, you, you provide a lower bound for this number, and hence uh, showing that this m this estimation is sharp. Okay. So here is the question. Can we construct? Bipartite graph uh, is you know n vertices on the left and n vertices on the 
plus. So let's try to see, uh, you know, here is a problem, you know, you want to construct a graph such that it satisfies certain conditions. So the first thing come up in, to your mind is to say, maybe let's try to, you know, construct a random graph. Let's try to do that. Okay. So we'll attempt to solve it using uh, the Eldritch magic. But unfortunately, at the end, you will see you know, uh, the proof uh, kind of uh, falls apart. Uh, okay, but still, we will try that, because uh, in our random uh, algebraic technique, we will see similar uh, techniques, but with an uh, algebraic twist. Um, so we attempt to uh, do the following. Uh, for each edge, okay. I'm sorry, for each UB, so let me call this set L, it's a part for each pair UB in L plus R, i.e. I pick uh, U in L and B in R, uh, <coughs> Include edge U B okay, in my graph with probability P, where P I will choose as uh, n to the power of minus one less. Okay. So you might be wondering why I choose this uh, probability P because uh, you know n to the power of one uh, minus one less. Because if you look at the expected number of edges that I will get in my, uh, in my random graph G, I will get exactly uh, n to the power of 2 minus 1 over s. Because there are n square many pairs uh, UB. And for each pair, since the probability is included in the graph, is n to the one minus 1 over s. Therefore, I will get n to the power of 2 minus 1 over s. Uh, on average, the number of I'm interested in the following uh, object, n of u, which is actually a common neighbor is connected to all the edges or all the vertices in U. Okay? If it's, it connects to all the vertices in U, I include it in my set N of U, otherwise I don't put it in my uh, N of U. And so U is bad if N of U has size greater than equal to two. This is the kind of object we want to avoid. Because if we have a bad U in our um, in our random graph, then 
I will find a KST. Okay? The way you find KST is to take this U and look at the common neighborhood of U. Since it has size greater than or equal to T, therefore you have a you know, KST in a random graph. So in particular, we want to you know, bound the expected number of that U. So expected number of bad U is equal to summation of all such U's, i.e. I take S vertices on the left, and then I calculate uh, sum over the probability that U is bad. Okay. So how do I find probability that u is that? Uh, I don't know. Uh, let's see. Um, maybe let's look at this random variable. Okay. So fix fix this u, and we look at this random variable n of u, uh, the, the cardinality of n of u. Okay. So actually, I claim uh, this is equal to uh, uh, let's say i of u1 plus i of v2 plus i of vn. Okay. Let me explain what I mean by this i of vi. Uh, where i of vi is a Bernoulli variable, 1 or 0, and if it's equal, uh, it's equal to 1, if uh, vi is adjacent to u, and u is adjacent to vi uh, from all u in big u, otherwise. I.e., you know, I enumerate all the vertices in, on the right by v1 through vn, and for each one I associate with a random variable indicating whether this vertex on the right connects to all the vertices in u. And it's equal to 1 if this happens, it's equal to 0 otherwise. If I add those up, I will get the cardinality of n of u. Mm, so uh, this is a this is a uh, this is a summation of a bunch of random variables, and they are all independent with each other. Um, and for each variable, actually, the mean of the of the variable is equal to uh, I believe it's equal to one over n. So let's try to check that. Um, the expectation of i of the i is equal to the probability that i of the i is equal to one i.e. the probability that uh, u is adjacent to vi for all u in u. Okay. But this is exactly um, p to the power of s. Okay. For each edge between vi and some vertex in u, it appears with probability p, since they are independent, so you just raise p to the power of s. And p to the s is one way. So actually, this variable, uh, n of u, uh, the cardinality of n of u, is a bunch of uh, the, uh, n, the sum of n Bernoulli variables with mean 1 over n. Okay. Sum of independent Bernoulli variable and the variable with mean. And here is a heuristic we want to use. Well, once you have a Bernoulli variable with you know mean one over n, take the sum, you get actually a, a binomial distribution. Okay, and the mean of the binomial distribution is equal to one. But as n is, uh, if n goes to infinity, this behaves like a Poisson uh, distribution. So approximately. Uh, this is 
of Poisson random variable uh, with meaning Now we can compute uh, the probability uh, that U is that. Uh, so now the probability that the fixed U is that, i.e., the probability that this random variable we just analyzed is greater than equal to T. Okay? Since I know this is approximately a Poisson uh, distribution, we can, you know. Compute actually, I will use this squiggle. This is a uh, uh, k with t uh, e to the minus one over k. Okay, this is a distribution you get from a uh, Poisson uh, random variable, and you can prove uh, this is less than equal to one over t factorial. Okay. So using that, I can tell uh, the expected number of that u. Since I'm summing over you know, this 1 over t factorial, and I'm taking all the possible u's here, so I will get n to s, okay? since l is of size n, and you are picking s versus all of it, and we get this 1 over t factorial. And you know, we wish you know, this number is small. Okay? We wish you know, the expected number of bad u is less than or equal to, say, half, or less than or equal to one. But this is not possible as S and T are constants and N goes to infinity. Okay, we want to find arbitrary, find, find this uh, construction for arbitrary large N. So this fails at this step. Um, so, the method, um, let me try to uh, wrap, wrap up all the applications and try to tell you the pattern of those applications. So basically, you start you know, with a bunch of coins, and then you flip all the coins, you get your object G. Okay? And then you prove you know, uh, with high probability or with positive probability, uh, the random graph G you get uh, satisfies certain conditions. This is the classical probabilistic method. So the random algebraic method is as follows. So you uh, still you flip your coins, and then you flip your coin to get a polynomial f. Okay. I will you know, tell you more detail about this polynomial f. Uh, and how you select it uh, from certain spaces. And then from this f, you get your graph g. There's also a way to you know, induce a graph from polynomial. And basically, this g will, will work. Uh, will work. Okay. So this is a uh, random uh, algebra. I think. Uh, there is something uh, we need to do actually uh, for this graph G, but I will explain it in detail later. Um, so let me tell you the first step. How do we randomly select a, a polynomial f? Okay. Our goal is still to construct a graph you know, with n vertices on the left, n vertices on the right, and uh, you know, no KSP, and we want to cram in as many edges uh, as, as we can. So the first step is to consider uh, the set P, which is the set of polynomials F uh, with actually uh, two S variables. And also the coefficients of this polynomial, uh, these coefficients 
in f sub q, where f sub q is some uh, finite field. Uh, I'm not finished, but uh, degree less than equal to d. Okay? Specifically, here I will take d because s squared minus uh, s plus t. Okay? But this will, will not be important for the time. But we will you know, get back to this uh, uh, um, d later. Okay, specific D later. Uh, so let's see. Uh, this set P uh, is finite. Right? Because I have a finite field, the coefficients only takes Q in different values. And since the degree is also bounded, so P is a, is a finite set. And what I'm going to do is to take an element from P randomly, uniformly at random. Okay? This is how I get my polynomial f. So I explain the first part. In the second part, I want to use this f to construct a certain graph g. Okay. And this is important. So my graph g, the left part I set, will be fq to the s. And on the right, I will also have fq to the s. So L is that. This is my r. And then, for any two uh, vertices, on the, one on the right and one on the left, I connect it if f of u v is equal to zero. Okay. Uh, this matches with the type of everything I've defined. Look, uh, uh, since f is a polynomial with you know two s coordinates, so it takes u as the first set s coordinates and. Uh, V as the, sec, uh, the last set S uh, coordinates. Okay. So let me just write this down. Include UV in my random graph G if F of UV is equal to zero. Okay? <coughs> uh, but the, the, uh, here is a twist with the, this approach. Uh, you know, if we look at all the random graph G, um, we will see for certain graph, we have, still we have uh, some copies of uh, KST, but there are not many. So for those, we just delete some edges or vertices to get a, a completely uh, KST-free graph. So here the caveat is further we you know, delete few edges to get G prime, which is completely uh, uh, KST. Okay. So this is our plan. Um, And then I will, I will argue that the expected number of uh, edges in my G prime is greater than or equal to some constant times n to the power of 2 minus 1 of the expression. Oh, sorry, I, I thought I missed it. What's the domain of that? Um, F is a polynomial, so... From, uh, because y, u, and v could be a point in the domain, I uh, didn't get y, u, Because yeah, f takes two s variables. Uh -huh, yeah, y, so u, u U is in f q to the s, so u has, has s coordinates. Each coordinate is in oh. f of q, okay. s of q. Okay. 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 So maybe let's try to you know estimate to you know just start gently. Let's try to estimate the number of edges in my random graph G. I will break this down to uh, probability that uh, summation over probability that u v is an edge of g. Okay. What's 
also a probability that UB is an edge of G, you know, by definition, it's the probability that F of UB is zero. Okay? And now I'm going to use conditional probability. So if I'm given all the terms except the cost term, you mean the expectation of that. The expectation of that. Okay. Yeah, I you know, probability is like a prisoner survey. So <laughs> kind of rusty. Um, anyway. So what do I mean by this f minus f of zero? That means given all the terms in my f except the constant term. Given that, I want to compute the probability that this f of uv is equal to zero. Okay. But look, what's this probability? I mean, this probability is actually, let me just write. Expectation of probability that my constant term f of zero plus my f minus f of zero, the non constant terms evaluated at uv is equal to zero. Condition on that my non constant terms are given. So if you look at that, given f minus f of zero, this is the term. Okay? Therefore, I'm saying, what's the probability that f of zero, the constant term of f, is equal to a specific value? There are q many choices for the constant term. Therefore, this is equal to 1 over q. Okay? And then, if you sum over, so this is equal to 1 over q, you take the expectation, you get 1 over q, and you're summing over n square many uh, u. So you get n square times 1 over q, which is nice, because q, uh, I, I didn't mention, actually, what's n, n is equal to uh, q to the s. The number of vertices on each part of is that. So q is equal to n to the uh, 1 over s, therefore this is n to the, okay. this is of the correct magnitude. So this is, a, I will call this my observation 1, okay. observation 2. Um, basically I want to calculate the number, expected number of value. Okay. This value is defined in the, uh, in the same way, you know, which is uh, um, S vertices on the left, and then you look at the uh, cardinality of the common neighbors of U. If it's greater than or equal to T, I call it bad, otherwise, you know, it's good. So let me just. Remind you, uh, u is bad if uh, the cardinality of common neighbor of u is greater than equal to t. Okay. And this is, uh, uh, so in order to estimate that, uh, actually I'm going to compute uh, the expectation of the cardinality of u raised to these polygons. Once I have this estimation, uh, sorry. Um, sorry. I'm actually interested in the probability that there is the, there exists a value. 
And one, once I have this estimation for the expectation of the cardinality to the raised to the power of d, I can use, I forgot whether it's Markov inequality or you know, Chebyshev inequality, to estimate the probability that there exists a value. Okay. So recall that the cardinality of n of u is actually equal to i v1 plus i v2 all the way to i v n to the power of d. Okay. Uh, let, me, let me remind you the definition of i of, I of v1. So I have u on the left and for, e, uh, for v1 on the right uh, i of v1 is equal to 1 if v1 is connected to other, uh, other vertices in u, otherwise it's equal to 0. It's a nulli variable. And if you add them up, you get the cardinality of the common neighbors of u. So now I'm going to expand this something to the d, okay, and use a linearity of uh, the expectation. So it's actually summation over all, uh, yeah, let me do it slowly, it's expectation of summation over all possible choices of my v1 uh, up to v, okay, v, that is r, and then I have i v1, i v2, D. Does this make sense? You just expand everything to the power of d. Okay. Uh, I saw the abuse notation here. V1 up to Vn is uh, is the uh, is the enumeration of the vertices seen uh, on the right. But you know, V1 to V3 here denotes the different different things. Okay. Um, and then I'm going to use uh, on the right, and then expectation of IV1, IV. This is the narrative of the expectation. Uh, okay. Notice that if V1 through VD you've chosen here are different, then you cannot simplify this multiplication. Okay, I of V1 times I of VD. But suppose, you know, maybe, you know, v1 and v2 are equal, you choose the same v1 and v2, then you will have iv1 times iv2, but since v1 is equal to v2, so this is just iv1 squared, but note that i of v1 is either 0 or 1, so you just get i of v1, right? So there is some redundancy uh, in this expression if you consider, you know, if uh, whether there is a duplication in your choice of u1 through v2. So I'm going to write this as um, summation over r less than equal to d m times r summation of v which is a subset of the right choose how many vertices and then probability so expectation by uh, probability expectation of i uh, product of little b in big b i of a. Let me try to, oh, I didn't say that this mr is equal to the number of subtractions from uh, set d to set uh, Basically, what I'm doing is that I'm uh, I'm considering the set formed by V1 through Vd, okay, and point V. And then, 
inside here is just that. But then I have this m, m sub r many duplication of such thing because if I only know the set v1 through vd, I cannot determine which is v1, which is vd. Okay? So there are m r many ways to assign v1, vd to this set v. Okay? And then uh, here I'm just you know summing over all possible size of all, all sets of v. Okay? So for instance, if r is equal to one. That means all the, v, uh, all the all the vi's here um, are, are the same. Uh, therefore, uh, you know, you choose one uh, uh, one element from the right, and then some uh, you take the expectation, and then you multiply the number of ways you can assign v1 through vd to this particular element, which is just one. All right. So what is this one? Suppose you've taken, taken R and you've taken V, and let's look at specifically this is expectation. Actually, this expectation is equal to the probability that U and V forms a complete bipartagram. Here, I'm taking the product of I of V, where V is in my capital V. Okay? And it's equal to 1 if this happens. All the edges are present between you and V. And it's equal to 0 you know, if there is one edge missing. Therefore, the expectation of this indicator function is actually the probability. I mean, this one is indicating this event. Okay? Once you take the expectation, the probability of it. I.e. now, we want to focus on the following event. If I have S vertex on the left and R vertex on the right, I want to calculate the probability of such an event. Okay. So let's do that. Uh, fix. S vertex set uh, U and L and R vertex set V on the right. Okay. I want to calculate the probability that this happens. Okay. I.e., according to my definition, this is a probability that F of u v is equal to zero for all u in capital U and v in capital V. Okay. Because an edge is present if the evaluation over uh, the uh, end, ends of the, the vertex is uh, zero, is equal to zero. Okay. But how can we do that? Uh, just one over q to the power u e. Yes. Oh, you mean rs? Yes. Yeah, how do you know that? Because you look at the same trick. No, it's not the same trick, but it's similar. Okay. Okay. But you are like, I mean, I wish I could uh, skip this, but I will give you the flavor of the proof. So again, this time I'm not isolating the constant times. So remember before the trick is to say, maybe, you know, let me just fix all the con uh, non-constant terms and trying to figure out the, uh, you know, this conditional probability. But this time, I'm go going to do the following. I'm going to consider the probability of this event conditioned on uh, all terms, uh, not of the form, all terms, but not uh, those terms that looks like x1 to the i, y1 to the j, where i is less than s, j is less than r. I fix. I give. I'm specifically interested in those terms that doesn't look like x1 to the i and y1 to the j, where i, j 
one is less than equal to s, and the other is less than equal to r. Okay. And you can show once this is given, you know, the way you can choose the terms that looks like x1 to the i and y1 to the j has probability 1 over q to the rs. Okay. And you know, I guess I will skip this. Okay. So the conditional probability is equal to 1 over q to the rs. And this uh, is great because now I have an estimation of this. So I can have MR, uh, then you know, I have a summation over, uh, over 1 over Q to the RS, and this, is, uh, this gives me an N choose R, and I multiply it uh, with 1 over Q to the RS. And with some estimation, uh, you can show this is, equal, is, is bounded by some constant which depends only on R, 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 S and T. Okay. So it's, uh, it doesn't depend on any question. Um, just for the finite field, uh, is there a factorization like a fundamental theorem of algebra? Is there some um, I'm not using the fundamental theorem. I'm not factoring. Factoring is how. Yeah, yeah, I know, but is there such a theorem? Oh, for, 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 for finite field? Yes, yes, yes. Well, so oh, so the what's the fundamental theorem you are referring to? It has a root, root right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But then you just say any, any polynomial over FQ has a root in FQ bar, where FQ bar is the algebraic closure of FQ. I wouldn't say it's a theorem. By definition, it has a root in it. It factors in FQ bar. Yes, that's the definition of algebraic closure. Right? Yeah. So, but uh, can we use some sort of like, algebraic argument like that? No, I'm not working with uh, algebraic closure here. So. Okay, Ex let's say you have some polynomial in uh, FQS. Can you extend it as a subspace to uh, algebraic closure and do something? Yeah. I yeah, I will do something with F, uh, uh, FQ bar later, but not here. And the other thing is that I think like you are only caring about the case where Q is large, right? When N yeah, is Q large. When so N is you large. can always yeah. assume that it's kind of like... You yeah, I, I want to say that edge is greater than equal to some constant times N to the some power 2 minus 1 over S. So I only need to care about when N is large. Yes. Because for small n, I can just you know adjust my constant c yes. to get a work with. So can I always like uh, assume you are working with the algebraic closure? Sure. No, algebraic closure is infinite field. Algebraic closure of a finite field is infinite, so you cannot. I don't know how do you define the, a finite graph. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so here the estimation is that you know you can have an estimation which is less than equal to a constant m, which only depends on s and t. Um, so let's you know try to recap. I have this, and I you know calculate it all the way and say it's less than equal to m. Therefore, by a you know, marker for Chebyshev inequality, this is less than or equal to. Uh, you know, the probability that this is greater than equal to t, i.e., you know, this to the power of d is less, uh, greater than equal to t to the d. Uh, therefore, this is expectation of, you know, this n of u to the d over t to the d. Okay? Okay. And I get, uh, sorry, I actually want to change t a little bit. I want to change it to that one. Then the TD, and then this is m over m. Uh, let me just say this is t, but let, let's see, see why this fails. So now I have an estimation m over t to d, which um sorry, and multiply it with uh, n choose s because I have n choose s many 
possible choice for my u. Okay. So a union bound, I need to multiply it by uh, n choose s. Here again, here I have n choose s, and this u is a fixed u. But this doesn't quite do the work, because it's similar to what we had in the first application, where in the first whereas in the first application I had one over t factorial, but this is, this is no better than that, right? This is m over t to the d. And you can't get what you want, because when n goes to infinity, this cannot be less than equal to one. So now we want to appeal to certain algebraic uh, structure of uh, of the graph we just defined. So this is our observation three. We care about you know the cardinality of this guy. In particular, I care about this uh, set, which is defined. Actually, you can define it this way: v on the right, such that f of u v1 equal to sorry, u1v uh, usv is equal to 1. Okay? If you enumerate your set u as u1 to us. Okay? So it's in the common neighborhood of u if v connects to all the vertices in u. Okay? And if it connects to all the vertices in u, that means f of u, u1v up to f of usv is equal to zero, our definition of the graph. Okay? In particular, we're interested in such set, w. I have a w, remember f is the finite field to the s, and then we have a bunch of polynomials as many polynomials, and they all evaluate to zero, uh, uh, to zero uh, when they are evaluated on v. Okay. So you might want to appeal to some results in algebra geometry and to say something about this set up. Okay. Here's the result you want to use. The cardinality of w satisfies Exactly one of the following. Either this guy is less than or equal to, uh, by the way, all those polynomials are of degree less than or equal to d. Okay? So the size of w is less than or equal to d to the s, or the size of w is greater than or equal to uh, q minus some constant times square root of q. Okay. So this is actually giving you a dichotomy. Uh, recall that d is a constant, which I define as s squared minus s plus 2. So this is a constant. So let's say either it's you know bounded by a constant from above, or it's very large. Actually, when you know q I take q, uh, q to the s equal to n, right? Imagine n is very large, and q is also large. So this is actually greater than or equal to q over 2. So either you have a very few points, or you have a huge number of points. Okay? Now I will take my t be this number plus 1. Okay? So then the probability that exists about u is actually equal to probability that u is bad, okay, i.e. probability that n of u has greater than or equal to two, uh, t, t vertices, where I take t equals d to the s plus 1. Okay. If this set is greater than d to the s, therefore it falls into the second category, where you have at least a q over too many vertices. So this is probability that n of u is greater than q over 2. Okay. But then I can apply my uh, Markov inequality to get 
this less than or equal to uh, m over q over 2 to the power of e. Okay? And then I you know, use union bound, I get pro probability that there exists a value that's less than or equal to n choose s times m over, now this time it's not t to the d, but q over 2 to the d. Now, for each bad U, I take out one vertex from the bad U and all the edges are adjacent to it. Okay? How many edges do I delete at most? I delete Q to the S many edges because there are only Q to the S many vertices in the left. So, delete for each bad U, delete, uh, delete one vertex from it. Okay. Then the expected number of edges are deleted. It's less than or equal to this quantity, n as n choose s, m over q over q to the d times q to the s. Because you can have at most q to the s many edges adjacent to a deleted vertex. And then once you've deleted all the all those edges, you get a KST free graph because there is no you know bad U. Um, therefore, uh, you know initially I have these many edges, and then you know I deleted those many edges, and the numerics works out if you take D equals S squared minus S plus two, and you still have something like half of n to the 2 minus 1 over s many edges left. And this graph is, you know, cast. Okay, so that's all I want to talk today. And thank you for your attention. Any comments or questions? So it's not really sensitive to what that means. Uh, as long as it's a uh, And it's of positive degree. I guess the degree plus uh, so the coefficient is like all there. The coefficients are f of f of q. Otherwise, you won't get those uh, one over q to the i's, which you know, uh, you yeah, quickly pass the answer. I don't know how. <laughs> so you won't get those if you allow arbitrary coefficients. Yes. Yeah, so aside from that, there's no other. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, you know, the algebraic results also relies on this. Uh, thing. So actually this comes from the Kazoo theorem and this is kind of like the long wave bound for algebraic um, variety. Yeah, it's, uh, it will depend on all this degree. Or, uh, yeah, this depend on degree and also the finite field and underlying finite field. I think it's somehow very integral to the proofs. So. Oh, that's fine, I like it. Yeah. Yeah, so 